Out of the G7 countries, Japan routinely comes in with the lowest murder rate out of the seven. Because of this, there's this international reputation that Japan is a somewhat peaceful and safe country as far as homicide is concerned. It's just not something that the average citizen is particularly concerned about compared to a lot of other countries where that has to be on your mind. Because of this, when there is a murder, those nearby take it incredibly seriously. And when there's a really violent, unique case, it quickly garners international attention. And in the 90s, there was such a case. This case was so heinous, so shocking, that it resulted in the entirety of the country looking over their shoulder, holding their children tight because they were afraid that some 35 to 40 year old man would snatch their child and decapitate them. As you go through life, it's not uncommon for people to ask you, are you a daddy's girl? Are you a mama's boy? But it's not as common for people to ask, are you a grandma's boy? And Shinshiro really resented that because he was a grandma's boy. He loved no one more than his grandma. And don't get me wrong, like he didn't have a hard family life or anything like that. It wasn't that he was seeking shelter at his grandmother's house or his parents were negligent or maybe even just really busy. They just weren't around. That bond wasn't as deep. It wasn't anything like that. In fact, Shinshiro's parents really loved him. They made a conscious effort to be present for him and his brothers, and they were pretty well adjusted. It was just a matter of connection, I guess, like something ineffable. He just loved hanging out with his grandma. Whenever he was with her, he always tried to impress her. If she needed anything, he always wanted to help. For example, she had really bad shoulders. I mean, she was elderly, she was often hunched over, and so sometimes she would need a little bit of help with her massage gun to get spots on her shoulders that she just couldn't otherwise reach in her old age and Shinshiro was happy to help. A lot of other kids might consider that to be a lame, boring, and maybe even kind of gross chore, but he would do anything to help his grandma. One of their favorite pastimes was they would go out in his grandma's garden and they would look at all the vegetables and they would just spend quality time together. She would tell them about all the different things that she was growing. He would help her water her plants and her little dog would run around them. And really when he looked back at those times, there was just nothing but good. It was such an innocent time in his life, such a happy time in his life, and he just really felt at peace whenever he thought about his grandmother. But as grandparents do tend to do, of course the day came where his grandmother unfortunately passed away. And just before his grandmother passed, she called him close because she wanted to leave one final message with him. I want you to become a defender of justice. I want you to defend the weak against the strong. And not long after, she unfortunately passed away. Shinshiro took this really, really hard. It's hard for any child to confront death for the first time, especially when it's a grandparent. And honestly, even when you're an adult, losing a grandparent can be incredibly painful. Especially for Shinshiro, his grandmother was sort of like a safety blanket. She was his safe space, just being with her in her garden. That's where he felt comfortable. That's where he liked to be. He had always been a little socially awkward and it was just harder for him to make friends. And after his grandmother died, he was experiencing a lot of social anxiety. And so his mom would kneel down to him and she would say, in a way that like a lot of parents would, you know, like a sort of mix of, think of your happy place. And if you feel anxious, just picture them naked. Instead, what she said was, if you get nervous talking to people, just pretend that they're a vegetable. Since he used to spend all of his time in his grandmother's vegetable garden. So it kind of marries those two tropes of what to do when you're anxious. And Shinshiro would do just that if he felt uncomfortable in an interaction with somebody and he just didn't like what was going on. He didn't know what to do. He would just think of that person as a vegetable. He found that actually this really worked for him. He really did prefer to think of people as vegetables. It made life a lot easier. Even still, 
he wasn't what you would call popular at school. You know, people didn't bully him or anything like that. They just sort of like didn't notice him. If he was out sick for a day, it wasn't a situation where he would come back to school and people would be like, oh, hey, like missed you yesterday. Like, are you okay? Were you sick? What were you doing? Really, he just was sort of background furniture at school. And he was all right with that, I guess, but his parents were more worried about it than he was, you could say, because his younger brothers, they were making friends at school, they were forming connections. And because of this, you know, sometimes Shinshiro would hang out with his brothers and their friends. And so it wasn't like he was completely socially isolated, but his parents just felt like he was such like a sweet, kind boy. And he had a lot of hobbies, he had a lot of interests. Like he has things to share with other people and they were just sort of waiting to see when that time would be that people discovered his talents. Shinshiro didn't really mind though, he's actually pretty busy. He kept himself occupied, idle hands and all that. One thing that he liked to do was experiments. In fact, he had developed a real fixation on slugs. This likely stemmed from when he would spend time with his grandmother in the garden because gardens do tend to attract slugs. And he actually saw a lot of himself in the slugs because unlike a snail, a slug is exposed. They don't really have a shell. And sometimes he felt like he was just sort of exposed to the elements like that and he didn't really know what to do with himself and he just felt kind of like gross and slimy and so it felt like a good mirror for himself. It was like a good allegory for how he felt, where his self-esteem was at. Which is why it's um, sort of concerning that he started to torture slugs. Uh, you know, you can't exactly call it self-harm when you're not actually harming yourself, even if you are projecting onto that animal when it is a creature that is actually alive. Now, some parents might dismiss that. They might not think like that's that big of a deal. You know, I remember being in elementary school when we all first found out that like slugs can't interact with salt and there would always be at least like one or two kids in your class who would then try and find a slug to see what happened. I mean, I wasn't one of them. I was more the type that would cry if I accidentally stepped on an ant. But you know, there were some kids who would go out and see what happened. And sometimes they would throw salt on the slugs. They would realize that they just killed the slug in this pretty horrible way. And they would feel immediately remorseful and you know, never do anything like that again. But that wasn't what Shinshiro did. He actually felt really good killing the slug. It felt right. He felt like he wanted to kill more slugs. So he started seeking out more and more slugs. And he didn't want to just put salt on them because at a certain point that kind of became boring. You know, he'd already been there, done that. So one of his preferred methods was actually that he would put slugs under heat lamps. They can't really adjust their internal temperature with their environment well. So it actually had pretty much the same effect as putting salt on the slug where they just end up secreting a ton of mucus to try and combat the dehydration that they're experiencing. And it gets to a point where they sort of turn themselves inside out. It's a pretty horrific process. And actually one time when Shinshiro was out trying to hunt for slugs, he ended up accidentally finding a frog. And he thought to himself like, you know, I'm really more of a slug guy, I kind of like identify with slugs, but I already have this frog. So, you know, idle hands while we're here, might as well see what happens. And he found that he actually really liked hurting the frogs. That They put up a little bit more of a fight than the slugs and they just felt a little more real than the slugs. So he would do a variety of different experiments. He told himself that he was simply like testing the boundaries of like what frogs could and couldn't survive. So he would do things like attach them to the road so that they couldn't move and then run over a long line of them with his bicycle. Or he would dissect them while they were still alive. And he would do this routinely. He said that this was all coming from a place of wanting to know, curiosity, experiments. But his teachers were kind of concerned. I mean, they didn't know about the frog things, but they had overheard him saying that he liked to hurt insects. And they had actually talked to his parents about this, where they were like, you know, that's kind of a concerning pattern of behavior. He's really young. He's saying that he likes to hurt insects. You know, most kids, they might hurt insects on accident or might hurt them not understanding that they're alive, but he seems to be 
fully aware that they're alive and that's what he likes about it. So I think you guys should look into this. And his parents sort of brushed it off. They're like, you know, he's in a transitional period. We just switched schools and stuff. You know, he might be acting out, but I really don't think killing bugs, you know, something that a lot of people routinely do is really anything to be worried about. And around the same time, you know, Shinshiro's parents had adopted his grandmother's dog. The dog that used to spend time with them in the vegetable garden. But as the dog had gotten older, you know, dogs don't eat the same amount of food as elderly dogs that they did when they were puppies or even just middle-aged. And so generally when his parents would lay out dog food for him, there'd just be a little bit left over. And his mom had a sort of waste not, want not mentality. So she thought the nice thing to do, the kind thing to do would be to just take his extra dog food and put it in a little saucer outside so that the stray cats could have some food. I mean, there's a lot of starving cats in their area. Just, it seemed like the kind thing to do. And the local cats definitely appreciated it and they actually came to rely on it a little bit. They knew that she would put out food every night. And most people would look at this and they would think like, this is a kind woman. That's an endearing gesture, you know, she's nice. She's empathetic. She cares about the stray cats. But Shinshiro, he, he felt kind of disturbed by it. Yeah, it just kind of, it, it frustrated him. You know, he felt like that was his dog's food. It belongs to his dog, point blank period. Whether or not his dog wants to finish it, intends to finish it, that's not the point. You know, the point is that it was initially assigned to the, to the dog and now you're just giving it away. But he didn't voice these concerns to his mother, it just was something that sort of irked him in the back of his mind. And then, like I said, this was an elderly dog, it was his grandmother's dog. The dog eventually did pass away from natural causes, he just, he was too old, you know? And after he passed away, Shinjiro's parents, they still had all this leftover dog food, so his mom just started putting out full servings every night, sort of keep the tradition with the cats. It was a routine that she came to rely on. It kind of helped her grieve for the dog, feel like she was putting something positive back out and not like wasting what was his, but this was a real escalation to Shinshiro. He felt like this was incredibly disrespectful to his grandmother's dog. He didn't like when the, the leftover food was being given to the cats and now you're just gonna give all his food away? Now that he's dead, you're just gonna get rid of all of his stuff? No. So, one day, Shinshiro went outside and he waited for one of the stray cats to come upon the food. As they routinely did, they, they were used to this food being there. And he saw this one really skinny cat come up to eat the food and I'm gonna spare you guys the details because I have a cat I really don't I don't want to get into it there's really detailed accounts of this incident in other places online if you want to find them but long story short he would end up taking a brick and smashing the cat to death and he would do other things to the cat he he like popped the cat's eyes and stuff really horrific stuff and again this is like the the heavily censored version of these events. I'm not gonna go into more detail than that, but while he was doing these terrible things to this cat, he sat there for a moment and he thought to himself, wow, what a beautiful cat. He loved its eyes, which is why he did those terrible things to its eyes. It's important to note that just after Shinshiro had killed that cat, he also had his first experience of being aroused. He was a young kid when this happened. He had never had an experience like that before. And there was no physical contact with himself or anything like that, but he had noticed like a change in his body that had never happened before. Once his grandmother's dog was gone, he just felt more separated from her than ever. You know, he just didn't know what to do. He even missed like the random stuff that they would do. Like sometimes they would just take a bath together, not in a weird way at all. It, there's no sort of like, there's no indication of any like trauma between him and his grandmother. These were like supervised baths, like normal stuff that you would do with your grandma where she would just wash his hair when he was really, really little. But he just found that he missed like 
any and every experience that he ever had with her. So he started going around to her house a lot so that he could spend time in her garden, just try and like process this loss. He was having a really hard time processing this loss. And one day he walked in, he walked through the vegetable garden, he looked at all of his vegetables. He went inside and while he was in the house going through her things, looking at old pictures of her, he found her back massager. And he just sat there for a second chuckling to himself, thinking about like all the times that he had to massage out the knots in her shoulders. And he was like, actually, I'm feeling kind of tense. And so he turned it on, he started using it on his own back. So Shinshiro's massaging his shoulders. He's thinking about his grandmother. He's looking at a picture of her, just thinking about her, how much he misses her, thinking about when he went to her funeral and like he saw her in the casket and he touched her hand, how cold and stiff she was and how she just didn't look the same, but she also looked exactly the same. And as he's thinking about these things and he's looking at these pictures and he's massaging his shoulders, he starts moving the electric massager down and across his body. And all he's thinking about on a loop is his grandmother being dead, what it looked like when she was dead, how it feels now that she's dead, confronting death for the first time ever, how much he misses his grandmother now that she's dead, just constantly in a loop, thinking about his grandmother, thinking about the fact that she's dead, looking at a picture of her, thinking about her funeral, all the while getting progressively more aroused until he gets to a point of completion that is so extreme that it actually causes him to pass out. He wakes up, who knows how long after, covered in stuff and realizes what had, had happened. By his own account, it is at this moment that Shinshiro's concepts of death and were intertwined forever. It's after this experience that Shinshiro becomes very academic. He starts spending all of his free time studying, reading, making spreadsheets, trying to note patterns, trends, things that he should and shouldn't do. He's spending all of his time studying serial killers. He wants to know, you know, which ones are the best? Who's the best one who's ever done it? He also wants to know, how do you avoid getting caught? Because after all, most serial killers that we know about, we only know about them because they got caught. There's only a select few that are really truly infamous who would go on to be undiscovered, one of which was the Zodiac in San Francisco. And Shinshiro really respected the Zodiac. He liked how he messed with the police. He thought that was a nice touch that even now to this day, the Zodiac is terrorizing people and he's probably not even alive anymore. But it's the ghost of his crimes. It's the fact that they were never solved. It's the ciphers left behind claiming that his name is in them if they can just crack the code. Shinshiro really respected that. He felt like in addition to the crimes, it was an extra layer that he thought added a lot of intrigue. He liked the psychological component. He also really liked Ed Kemper. Now, even though Ed got caught, so he was certainly gonna throw out a lot of his tactics. And I mean, at the very least him getting caught means that he can learn what not to do. He still really liked Ed because he felt like he could identify with Ed on certain things. I mean, Ed was really incredibly close with his mother and Shinshiro felt that way about his grandmother. So he felt like he could understand where he was coming from. He also liked that Ed was a necrophile, that he would defile corpses in an intimate way after he had killed people. He also liked the idea of decapitating someone and then being intimate with their head, which Ed Kemper notably did with his own mother. He felt like that was a really interesting idea. So that went on his spreadsheet of something to do. He wanted the Zodiac's patterns. He liked his letters and obviously he liked that he didn't get caught. He also liked that Ed was a necrophile and he liked 
the idea of decapitating somebody, all of that appealed to him. In a similar vein, he also really liked Andre Chinchadio, who he put on a lot of his spreadsheets as well. He first thought of him because he was also a necrophile, but what Shinshiro was more interested in was his philosophy surrounding cannibalism. Because he was a cannibal as well, he believed that if you ate somebody, you could consume their life force and take that for yourself. And Shinshiro felt like that was a real fine idea. He thought that that was an incredibly interesting concept and he wanted to test it out for himself. So currently he's got the patterns, the notes, not getting caught, necrophilia, decapitation, cannibalism, and potentially the consumption of someone's soul as a result. He felt that these seven traits were key for accomplishing all of his goals. At this point in Shinshiro's research, he felt it was time to get in the field. He'd experimented with frogs and decapitating pigeons. He was now killing cats on a very regular basis. And so he felt like he needed to start doing his experiments on people. He wanted to see what people can endure in the same way that he had done, air quote, tests on animals. So one fateful day in the 90s in March, Shinshiro went out to a local park. He wasn't quite sure what he was looking for. He just knew that when he saw it, he would know. He decided to bring both a hammer and a knife. He wasn't really sure which one he was going to use first, but he wanted to test them both out. So it was good to have options. After a while of sort of scouting out the park, stalking a couple different people, he landed on one 10 year old girl. He walked up to her and he asked her if she knew of anywhere where he could wash his hands. She wasn't immediately suspicious of him or anything. I mean, he's also a kid. So she promptly told him yes, and that she was willing to show him where it was. She walked a bit out of the way over to where he could wash his hands. And when they got there, Shinshiro told her, hey, I really want to thank you for being so kind and walking me over here. So could you just turn around so I could thank you? And she was kind of confused, I'm sure, but he seemed nice enough. So she turned around so that she was facing away from him. And at this moment, he took out the hammer and he bashed her in the side of the head. And he just kept bashing until he was certain that she had died. He said that he doesn't remember this very well because he was in such a frenzy. He was essentially, disgustingly, having such a good time that it was all a bit of a blur due to the adrenaline. Shortly after he washed himself off, he got on his bike and he promptly started following a little boy home because he still had his knife that he wanted to test out. He followed this boy for quite a while, but before he could get a good opportunity, the boy actually ducked inside a house. Now, I doubt he did this because he knew Shinshiro was there. He probably just actually reached his destination and Shinshiro didn't have an opportunity to corner him or find an organic opening. But this didn't really deter Shinshiro. He just decided to pivot. So he started stalking a few different people until eventually he saw a girl. And he decided that he was just sort of going to take an almost drive-by approach. He was going to run up behind her and just stab her in the stomach. And this girl was around 11 years old. So he did just that. He ran up, he stabbed her in the stomach, and he ran away. And this was a five-inch knife. So a girl that small, that's going at least halfway through her abdomen if he got her from the side this way, let alone this way. After he stabbed her, he was confident that she wasn't gonna make it. He rushed home and by the time that he got to his front door, sirens were blaring. There was a whole frenzy in the area because he had gone to a local park to do all of this. And his mom was really worried. She had been watching the news. She wanted to know what was going on. And about a week later, she informed Shinshiro that that girl, that poor girl who had gotten just brutally attacked in the park with a hammer had died. 
Shinshiro had documented all of this in his diary and he'd breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief because he felt like he had gotten away with it. But the news had also revealed that the girl that he had stabbed had survived. Shinshiro was actually really confused by this. He talked about how confused he was and he seemed kind of irritated that his expectations were defied. It seemed to him that a hammer killing a person seems less likely than a knife. So if he successfully killed someone with a hammer, it was a shoe in that his knife would kill someone. But that just wasn't the case. He was still figuring out what did and didn't actually kill people. And this was the first moment that he started to realize that killing your own species was a little actually logistically harder than killing something significantly smaller than you. I wish there was more information on the girls, but Japan has much stricter privacy policies as far as victims and perpetrators for that matter are concerned than America. So there just isn't as much information. We do know that the parents of the girl who was killed with a hammer decided for the rest of their lives to keep a small pair of shoes on their front porch as a sort of gesture that she would be watching over everyone and maybe she was just a moment away from coming home. As truly heinous and horrible as all of this is, this is actually just the beginning. All of this, everything that's transpired so far, has just been the lead up to what the case actually is. And before moving forward, I just want everyone to be warned that this specific crime that we're about to get into is incredibly disturbing and it is very difficult to understand because it's such a rare instance and I don't mean understand as in like empathize or or anything like that it's just actually so shocking and inhuman of a decision that it is just legitimately difficult to reconcile with so if you're not in the mental space to hear something that you truly can't unhear, then maybe click away. Shinshiro up until now has attempted to commit two murders and he's only succeeded in one. This is child on child murder. At this time, he was just 14 years old and his victims have been 10 and 11 so far. But these two cases, though people were concerned, though it made the news and people wanted to know who did this, what happened, what's going on, they actually pale in comparison to what would happen next. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful sense to the victims' families because these are real severe tragedies that have like ruined lives and altered the trajectory of countless others. So. I don't want it to seem like I'm at all downplaying a child death. It's just that that's actually how high the standard is for how disturbing this next part is. Because a child being murdered by another child under any circumstances, let alone with a hammer in a park like that, that is incredibly disturbing. You would think that that is the peak of, of just how horrible somebody can be. But what happened to June? I mean, I've actually never heard of anything like it. And, and it's, it's just so incredibly hard to imagine what it must be like to be his parents and to have to try and unpack something like this. May 27th, 1997. That's when this happened. This would actually go on to be a landmark case. Japan's laws have been changed forever since this. There's a local elementary school. It's a few hours before school starts. Staff is just starting to arrive when a detective gets a disturbing report, a report so shocking that he actually thinks that it is incorrect, that somebody is, is mishearing someone because this can't be. The report that he gets is that on the front gates of the school that have yet to be opened is the decapitated head of an elementary school boy who went to that school. And now his teachers have just found him. Not only that, but 
It is clear just from looking at the school gate that this poor boy's head had been placed on a multitude of the gate's spikes before the killer decided which location they liked. And they didn't even bother to clean off the spikes or, or make it seem like they hadn't done that. In addition to that, the boy's eyes had been gouged out and his eyelids had X's cut in them. And this next detail is actually what made the case so famous, what made it national news, what made it cause a literal national hysteria was the fact that there was a note in the boy's mouth. And the note reads as follows. This is the beginning of the game. Try to stop me if you can, you stupid police. I desperately want to see police die. It is a thrill for me to commit murder. A bloody judgment is needed for my years of great bitterness. And at the end of the note is a symbol. It sort of looks like one of those fans that you hold in your hand if you're like walking around an amusement park. Later profilers would determine that it's a sort of juvenile mix of the Zodiac Killer sign as well as a swastika. The note is then signed with an alias, Saito Shakibara, as well as two English words. One of the words was misspelled. It read as Shul Killer. What was most certainly intended was School Killer but it was spelled S-H-O-L-L. -L. Because of this note, the case was immediately elevated to, to mainstream news. This was clearly a serial killer. There was a lot of panic that this could be a potential Zodiac situation. The people of Kobe, Japan were very concerned that they were gonna be the new San Francisco and pretty much every news outlet was drawing that comparison. Of course, they were all referring to the killer as Saito Shakibara, but with Japanese, they have an alphabet called kanji, so different letters can actually mean different things depending. So when somebody introduces themselves, they generally say what letters are being used what way to spell their name. This isn't accurate, but oh, my name's Daisy. I use the character that means sunshine and the character that means happiness to spell my name. Because of that, with names, there can sometimes be a couple different ways you can interpret what somebody's name actually is. And in this case, one of the options was a really mainstream, commonplace name. And so the news believed that that was the name that they were attempting because it was a sort of default. And Shinshiro, he's watching this case unfold on television alongside everyone else. I mean, even if he didn't want to watch it, which he did, it wouldn't matter, it was inescapable. It was affecting every facet of his life because he was also a child. Schools everywhere were closed for three days after this. And when they were reopened, they were only reopened with very heavy police presence. And in Japan, normally when school starts, they open the gates and they just leave them open all day, but not after this. After this, all of the parents were expected to escort their children in person to the school, stand there while the gates were closed, wait till they were opened, watch their children enter the school alongside the police, and then the gates were triple locked. And basically the same routine was true for pickup as well. And after pickup, most parents went directly home. Normally, the Normally, a lot of different kids would spend time at the park or walking around and doing other fun activities after school, but that idea was not gonna fly anymore. And for the few parents who were brave enough to take their kids to the park, they would be on high alert. There would be a group of parents watching at all times and if their kids so much as went around the wrong side of the slide where they lost view of them for a moment, most parents would end up dipping. They would be like, this isn't worth the risk. I'm sorry, we can't do this. I told you, you have to stay on my sightline the whole time, it's not worth it. And while the kids were walking to and from school and the parents were waiting, everyone was dead silent, which just speaks to the level of anxiety that people had. They were all waiting to see if they could just hear anything, like if anything was gonna start. And things were different in school too. Now, some kids were being forced to drop certain classes that they could do personal safety courses. 
and everybody was required to participate in drills. Another thing that complicated everything is that when Jun's head was being placed on that gate, there was actually a witness, but the witness just wasn't actually that reliable. What he thought he saw was he thought he saw a 35 year old to 40 year old man who had a bag and was acting suspicious around the gate. And that's what he reported to the police. So while all of Japan is on high alert about this, they're all looking for a middle-aged man. No one is looking at kids who go to the school. And panic is just starting to rise. I mean, they haven't caught the guy yet. People are talking nonstop about Shaito Sakibara, and it is driving Shinshiro Azuma insane because they're all mispronouncing his alias. He didn't want people to be saying it like that. They're all saying it wrong. So he decides he's gonna do something about this. And what he does is he writes into the news directly, which makes this his second note, which reads as follows. From now on, if you misread my name or spoil my mood, I will kill three vegetables a week. If you think I can only kill children, you're greatly mistaken. He had internalized that bit about pretending people were vegetables a little too much because when he said that he would kill more vegetables, he was talking about people. He would call people vegetables routinely as a way to dehumanize them. And later, looking back on this, a lot of people would blame Shinshiro's mom not just for creating the vegetable narrative in his mind at an early age, which obviously that wasn't her intention, but still he turned it into this thing and twisted it up and made it this, this crazy mentality. But people also blamed her for potentially ignoring the signs. They felt like there were red flags and she just kept making excuses for her son. And unfortunately, it seems that at least some of that criticism is pretty valid, but what she wasn't looking past, because I really doubt she knew, was the fact that Shinshiro was hiding her other son's best friend's head in the tiles of his bedroom. And he hid him up there for quite some time before he ever put his head on that gate. And during that time, he did a lot of horrible things to Jun's head. See, Juno is liked Shinshiro. He thought that he was cool. He was his best friend's older brother. You know, how, how could he not? He would often talk to him about turtles. See, Jun was in the special education program and it's unclear online what sort of difference that he had, but regardless of that, he very clearly had a special interest in turtles. He would talk about them all the time. Shinshiro found this grating, I guess, but nowhere near as grating as Jun's eyes were. See, Jun was widely regarded as being an incredibly beautiful child. People felt that he had the literal face of an angel. He had such a sweet expression and he really just was a very handsome little boy. He had these beautiful, sweet, genuine eyes and he would just look at those around him with such real, sincere admiration and love. Shinshiro hated his eyes. He really hated Jun's eyes. He felt that Jun's eyes were mocking him, that his eyes were a perfect reflection of everything that Shinshiro was not because Shinshiro wasn't innocent or sweet or beautiful and he held a strong, deep belief that the more beautiful you are, the more innocent you are, and the more innocent you are, the more good you are. And Shinshiro wasn't beautiful or innocent and he certainly wasn't good. He also believed that 
eyes were the windows to the soul. And he felt that June's soul was mocking him, just rubbing it in his face, how uncorrupted his soul was. And one day he decided that he wanted to see what June's eyes looked like when he screamed. And so he walked over to him on the playground, shoved him to the ground and just started beating him to a pulp. They were separated and everyone's parents were called and when Shinshiro's mother arrived, she made an excuse for him. She didn't really understand why he would attack Jin. I mean, it seemed like they normally got along, but she just was convinced that this was really abnormal behavior for him and it, it wouldn't happen again. Shinshiro knew that that specific thing wouldn't happen again because he had seen Jun's eyes when he screamed and when he cried and it wasn't enough. It, it didn't make him feel better. And he would go on to say that he felt like those eyes were dangerous, that they were tempting him and it brought him back to feeling like a slug, like he didn't have a shell, he didn't have a way to stop himself or protect himself from temptation. He had nowhere to go. And he felt like those eyes were the ultimate temptation. So one day, Shinshiro walks up to Jun at the park. So he told him, hey, you know, I heard that there's a rare blue turtle on the top of Tank Mountain. And Jun believed him. He didn't feel like he had any reason not to. So he was immediately really excited and Shinshiro told him, you know, I could take you to see it if you want. Take Mountain was a very large hill and it had a massive water tank on the top. That's where it got its name from. It also had a small shack to the side. So the boys walked hand in hand all the way up the hill. Shinshiro had led him away from the park. And by the time they're at the top of the hill, you know, they're both pretty tired, it's pretty steep and Shinshiro brings June over by the shed and June is confused. He doesn't know where the turtle is and he is still not even, he's not even like mistrusting Shinshiro because he's a little boy, you know? He doesn't have that in him yet. And I will spare the details, but um, Shinshiro had a hard time killing Jun. It, it wasn't as easy as he thought it was going to be. He tried like three different tactics to try and um, suffocate him. And, you know, he eventually did but he had to try a lot of different things and June fought back the whole time and Shinshiro got to a point of desperation where he thought that he might not be able to follow through because he was just running out of physical strength. And I just feel so sad for that little boy because like he must have been so scared and confused in order to be fighting a, a 14 year old boy off when he was just 10 with that much energy. It's just a terrible situation. After Jun died, Shinshiro disgustingly said that he felt a great deal of satisfaction and that although he was worried about how difficult it was to take his life, it actually made him feel more validated after the fact, like he'd earned it. Um, and then he just left him there. He left his body there for a day and he came back the next day with a handsaw and that's when he decapitated June and took his head home with him. To this day, no one actually knows where June's body is, like what happened to it. No one knows. They only know what happened to his head. And like I said before, Shinchiro would take Jun's head home and hide it in the ceiling tiles of his bedroom. But he wouldn't just keep Jun's head in there. He would take his head out 
and he would even bathe with it, brush his hair like Shinshiro's grandmother used to do with him. And he said that from the moment that he had killed Jun, his head wouldn't stop talking to him. That his head just kept talking to him, complaining about how much it hurt, how terrible it was. And that he really just couldn't get him to be quiet. He claims that this is why he took his eyes out initially. Because he felt like, since they're the window to the soul, you know, I just need to take his soul out of this head and it'll stop talking to me. And that's why he also carved the X's in the eyelids after. But the head kept talking to him still. It, it still kept complaining. And this entire time, um, while he was doing all these things, Shinshiro was not only like doing things to himself to make himself physically feel good, but he was also engaging with the head um, to a point where fluid was in Jin's mouth. Shinshiro originally planned on burying Jun's head, but he said that he made a sort of game time decision where he decided to put it on the gate instead. He was going to bury it near the school, and he said that he got on his bike in the middle of the night, and he biked to school, and he felt such an intense sense of euphoria that he actually started singing out loud which is very uncharacteristic for him normally. He was actually singing the song Stand By Me, if anyone's wondering. But when he got to the school, he said that he looked at the gate and he just knew what he had to do. He was just struck with this feeling that he had to put it on the gate because he wanted attention. He wanted attention. Just burying June's head, maybe no one ever finds the body. That's not dramatic. That's not what he was looking for. He claims later that the reason he picked the school was because he was trying to make a statement about the rigorous academic expectations in Japan, which there's certainly been a lot of criticism over that, but I don't think that's true. In fact, I don't think a lot of the things that he says about why he committed these crimes are true. I think he's retrospectively trying to apply deeper meaning to things that probably don't have them. Going back and saying the eyes are the window of the soul, why he did this, why he did that, I think this is just him trying to feel like the main character. He's trying to add complexity when there probably isn't any. He probably just likes killing things. He likes hurting things. He's probably a classic sadist. I think he's applying meaning because egotistically he likes people thinking that he's this dark, complex character when the reality is that he's just always enjoyed hurting things. He likes the reaction. If anything, the only depth here is that like with the necrophilia stuff, he's trying to conquer death maybe. But the reality of necrophilia is that most necrophiles, there's like three or four different subcategories, but the majority of them are into necrophilia because they like the idea of somebody who can't withdraw consent, somebody who doesn't have any control, somebody who can't judge them or even perceive them for their divergent desires. It's about control and possession, and I think that Shinshiro saw this boy who was regarded by everyone as being beautiful and was really well liked and he wanted control over that and he wanted to possess that and he also wanted to defile that. He also claims that he tried to drink Jun's blood to absorb his goodness and that when he did that it really just tasted like metal so it doesn't seem that he actually was really buying into any of these rituals that he was practicing it was really just him doing what he's always done which is just messing around with animals and people, whether they're dead or alive, and seeing what does what. Because he's not experiencing the same kind of inhibitions that the average person would, which is also a hallmark of 
people who are necrophiles. It's clear that Shinshiro was just incredibly detached from reality because a month after Jun's murder, the police knock on his door in the middle of the night to take him in for questioning. And when they tell him that, he just sort of lazily gets up, he takes his time, he putts around, he decides what he wants to wear, and he's just not taking it very seriously. And when he gets there, they start asking him very real questions, and he is giving actual answers. The police led by saying that eyewitnesses had literally seen him lead Junwe from the park. And Shinshiro was like, okay, he's my little brother's friend. I'm with him all the time. Then the police let him know, hey, we know that you stabbed a girl back in March. She's ID'd you and confirmed that it was you. You also likely killed that other girl the same day in the same park with a hammer. And Shinshiro just confesses to that. He's like, yeah, so what if I did? And he's just not taking it seriously because he doesn't consider any of this to be hard evidence. Even though he just confessed, he doesn't consider it to be hard evidence because he has the mind of a child. He's a child. And when he begins further pressing about what hard evidence they have, the police reveal that they have his school essays and his writing in his school essays is exactly the same as the killer's notes because he had very distinct handwriting. Basically after like a week of not getting anywhere with this lead of it being a 35 year old to 40 year old man, the police just decided that they should start going over the students at the actual school's handwriting since it kind of looked childish and compare it to the notes, which is how they got a hit on him. And from there, they figured out the connection with the girls. And from this point forward, I mean, he barely puts up a fight. He pushes back a little bit, but it's not long before he confesses to having killed Jun. Now, after this, the principal of his school, a couple high profile lawyers and his parents, they're all going around saying that they feel that this was a forced confession that they feel like it's weird, it's not typical standards, like nothing seemed right about it, and they just they just honestly don't believe that a boy could have done all of this. They just don't think it, it's right. They think it sounds fishy. They think the police just needed to nail someone down because people were so panicked. It would be quite a while after Shinshiro's arrest before he actually got to see his parents in person for the first time, which he wasn't actually expecting to see them in person basically ever. Before he left for the police station, without even turning around, without even looking at his family, he told them that he didn't want them coming to visit him because obviously he knew what might happen, that he might not come back. And his parents hadn't taken this seriously, you know, they, they just kind of thought he's young, he doesn't know what he's talking about, if anything he's being dramatic, you know. But it was a while before they were actually able to go to the jail and see him. And when they got there, his mother was just like so heartbroken, you know, she was just so sad for him. You know, where she just, she just felt like he was innocent. And she was just telling him over and over again, like, just tell me you didn't do this, you know, like, that's all I need to hear. And then I'll fight tooth and nail for you because like, I know that you didn't do it. So like, you can tell me it's okay. It's okay. You can tell me seriously. I know you didn't do it. Just tell me that you didn't do it. I know you didn't already. So like, if somebody's making you say that you did it, like, it doesn't matter. You can just tell me that you didn't do it before eventually he was like, mom, there's no world wherein I did not do it. I did it. And his parents, he didn't really want to hear this. They, they were like, that's not, that can't be true. They were in deep denial. And they maintained that denial even after Shinshiro spent the next hour or so confessing to every single detail, aside from where he had put Jun's body, of what he did to Jun every single detail more than what i have been willing to cover in this video and after hearing all of these intimate details that literally no one aside from the person who killed june 
could possibly know. His parents still thought he's he he could it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make sense that he could have done this. Whenever there was an opportunity to give him the benefit of the doubt, his parents would, even when they did eventually come to terms with the fact that he wasn't innocent. For example, when it came to making a statement about the school system, they believed that that's what he was trying to do. Whereas pretty much everybody else knew that that probably wasn't true. If he was just trying to make a statement about the school system, he could have put Jun said on a different school's gate, a closer school's gate, any school's gate but he made the conscious decision to put it on the gate of the school that Jun went to so that in the morning, people who knew Jun would see it. And when people were mourning this, it would be people who knew him. So it maximizes the trauma. If it had happened at a different school or like at the high school nearby, it would have been in the news. His peers would have heard about it, it would have been sad, his teachers would have heard about it, they would have been sad, but they wouldn't have necessarily seen it, you know? So it seems like he was definitely trying to traumatize as many people as possible and he was going for that psychological angle. During his sentencing, because he was a minor, he was known as Boy A, but partway through this process, his identity was leaked and there's still like, it might not be the correct identity. Like there's still a couple people who are like, oh, we don't know definitively, like you can't prove it. But generally if that does happen, cause identities have been leaked in the past and they have been incorrect in the past, it'll be corrected pretty much immediately where the police will be like, oh, that's not the person. Like you're framing an innocent person. That's not right. No one corrected anything. The family didn't correct anything. The police didn't correct anything. No one corrected anything. So people are pretty sure that the face and name that was leaked to the public is correct. There's also even theories that investigators leaked it because they were worried with the severity of this case about people not knowing who did it, if he ever gets out, which because he was a minor, he would get out pretty quickly. Yeah. He was only sentenced to six years and 10 months due to his age. And for a lot of that, he was put into like very extreme rehab programs um, where they would try and like rewire the way that he interacts with, for example, by having him do things to himself while looking at appropriate media and talking about appropriate things. They would also put him through extensive counseling to try and like determine why he kills people and why killing people is bad. But even after he went through all of this counseling, he still can't actually tell anyone why murder is bad. The only conclusion he's drawn is that murder is too inconvenient, that the repercussions that come with murder when you're in a society and you're a part of the social contract far outweigh the joy that you can get from killing someone. That was what he said after he was released. And he had also echoed those same sentiments over the last six years through letters that he had written to June's parents detailing every agonizing detail of why he did what he did, how he did what he did, when he decided he wanted to do what he wanted to do, to who he wanted to do it to, and he would really drag things out so that they'd be forced to read all the letters just to piece certain elements of the story together. And June's parents, at a certain point, they started to feel like maybe these letters are being written to provide us some closure. You know, maybe he's trying to extend his empathy to us, just make any information available that we might want available, like answer any questions we might have. When what actually ended up happening was that Shinshiro was writing a book. And he was sort of using these letters as a way to like test the waters of what he was gonna say. And the book that he wrote is actually pretty much banned in Japan because it was so controversial. And I think it can be pretty 
decently compared to Lolita, not because of being on the banned book list or anything, but because the writing in it is very ornate. It, it's sort of like poetically written and it has like a lot of unnecessary details and there's a lot of depth attributed to each and everything that was done and most people just feel like this is him just trying to like make art out of murder and also turn a profit and even like the way he tried to advertise this book when he was released from prison he made a website which has since been taken down and on the website he included a bunch of pictures of himself where he just censored out his face but he showed his whole body and in a lot of them he was naked and he photoshopped a giant slug over his you know um and it was really disturbingly done like it kind of made it look like almost like a deformity because of the he picked like red slugs and stuff and so the the slug motif and like the weird like sexual angle of all of these pictures and like he would have walls of text accompanying them about how like being beautiful is being pure and he's trying to be beautiful and all these things that basically indicate that he is exactly the same person he's just claiming that he's not gonna murder anybody because it's not worth it but people still heavily suspected that he was probably like torturing animals there's no like evidence of that but that's what people thought and after he was released he was accepted back by his parents with open arms however it uh wasn't mutual he didn't really mess with them like that he he didn't really want to want to hang out with them long term he hung out with them a little bit while it was like still convenient for him and then he eventually just completely ghosted them and now people actually don't know where he is people are kind of concerned about that understandably so because last time that he was seen was years ago and he had allegedly had a wife and a young child when he was last spotted but it's been years since he's been spotted and he's been just living off the grid and so people are very worried that he might be getting up to his old activities just maybe in a way that you know looks a little bit more natural maybe he's just not looking for the attention anymore of course that's speculative he might be doing nothing but that's basically what people's concerns are and actually even before he was released from prison authorities announced his release which is super unusual for japan that's more normal here if there's like a, a big case but in japan that's very abnormal even with like a super infamous case so it gave the impression that the authorities were trying to warn people of his release and like I said, this was a landmark case because after this situation, Japan changed its laws about who is and isn't legally considered an adult. And they just so happened to drop that age down to 14. So, and one last thing from his book, he says in his book that he does not know the exact reason he kills people, but he refers to it as innate. He also says that it brings him solace and that it's, quote, only the pain of others that can alleviate my own pain. And this is a book that he wrote while in prison and published after the fact. His mom also wrote a book. It was not very well received, basically from the perspective of like what it was like to realize that you've raised essentially a monster. And it really just like stirred the pox a lot of people especially after reading her book felt like the signs were absolutely there and she just was willfully too blind to see him and i didn't read as many details about her book just because it's sort of a peripheral fact so i'm not sure how fair or unfair that is just from the information that i do know about like the insect thing and like him attacking jun those are two isolated moments that are really far apart so I could see her not getting that but but a lot of people suspect that she was actually aware of him killing cats and decapitating pigeons routinely and stuff and if that's the case then that's obviously her looking right past huge red flags but you know this is such a severe crime that even if she was worried that he was going down like a dark path, I don't think any reasonable person could predict the severity, like just how dark it is, because this is actually one of the worst things I've ever heard of. And the fact that all of this was done by a child, 
is absolutely like mind boggling to me. It's absolutely mind boggling to me. Normally I know I just, I go into more detail about like how a person was developed, how they became who they are, not so that we can like feel bad for them, but so we can sort of get it. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Like, I just feel like either there's a really key detail missing here because the stuff with the grandma is strange. There's no evidence of the grandma actually doing anything messed up, which doesn't mean that it didn't happen. But the, the question marks in this case of like, why did he become the way that he did are so massive. And that's also like one of the major themes of his book, apparently, which I'm not going to read because he does directly get money from that book. So like, pirate it if, if you really want to read it you know but it's only in Japanese there's no translations of it because like no one's trying to help this guy out you know but um yeah apparently a, a big theme of his book is just him basically crafting this narrative that he is the sole result of like nature that th there actually are no nurture elements at play here beyond the fact that like his parents didn't hold him super accountable a lot of the time. I mean, his grades weren't that good and they weren't very hard on him about that. They weren't strict about pretty much anything ever. But generally that doesn't result in somebody doing something this severe. So this is a, a situation that like, I feel like even if I did have all the facts, even if I could see the equation, it would be really hard for me just just to even believe that that equation exists but we're here with without even an equation really we're, we're just left with like and it equals this what equals that i don't know but this case like i learned about it like uh last week and i have been like so like disturbed by it just because like it's so extreme it, it's so odd. It doesn't make sense. We, we generally don't see this level of like, just, just absolute like depravity from someone so young. I mean, there are other serial killers who have been children. There are kids that kill and like, there are bad cases of kids that kill, but this is just like a whole, uh, it's just a whole nother, another level. And it's already such a rare thing it's like the stars aligned and created syzygy of like the worst thing that could happen. It, it, that's really all I could say. <laughs>